All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Hemp Grower Spotlight. This webinar series will serve as a platform for our local producers and allow other growers, agribusiness professionals, university and private industry to come together to discuss agriculture. Throughout the educational program, we will take short breaks to allow participants to contribute to a live Q&A via the chat box with our guests. At this time, I would like to take a minute to remind you all to please turn off your cameras and mute your microphones to help enable a smooth streaming experience for all. In today's episode, we will be talking with Northwestern Illinois producer Drew Grossinger of Clara Joyce Flowers in Stockton, Illinois. The goal of today's webinar is to provide the 2020 hemp producer class a review of the biggest lessons learned from the 2019 season. A large portion of the program will focus on lessons learned with regards to planting methods, fertility, harvesting, and storage. Throughout the educational program, you can ask questions, so feel free to do so. This webinar will be posted online at go.illinois.edu slash hemp shortly following the program. And so with that, let's get started. Well, before we delve a little bit deeper into each aspect of production, I just wanted to have an opportunity to tell our audience a little bit about yourself. So Drew, could you please tell us a little bit about your operation? Absolutely. Um, so like Philip said, my name is Drew Grossinger and uh, we have Clara Joyce Flowers. Um, Clara Joyce Flowers is a specialty crop and cut flower farm located in, in uh, Joe Davis County in Northern Illinois. Um, I have my uh, questions off to the side, so I probably won't be looking at directly into the camera, so forgive me on that. Um, but Clara Joyce Flowers um, is named after two women who um, were previously involved in our family. Um, they have both passed and it was a great tribute for us to name our farm after those two women. Um, I started farming as a 4-H project. Uh, when I was, I think, six or seven years old, I started growing vegetables. And shortly after that, I started selling at farmer's markets in the area. And one thing led to another, and it became a full-time business, and it's my full-time job. Um, I did not grow up on a farm, you could say. Uh, the property that I live at now is where I grew up. And when I was growing up, we did not have a farm. Neither of my parents farmed. Um, they came from farming backgrounds, so they understood the value and the hard work that went into a farm. Um, but everything that I have, the greenhouses, the pack sheds, all of the things um, were built because I did it. Um, how large is our operation? So we currently grow five acres of cut flowers every year. About two acres of that is in perennial production, and then the rest is in annual production. We currently have 5,000 square feet of greenhouse space. We are putting up two new greenhouses this year, so that'll take us up to between 12 and 13,000 square feet in greenhouse space. The vast majority of that is for cut flower production, but we also do a lot of custom growing of um, transplants and plugs, um, and we are getting into custom hemp plug production um, this spring as well. So we currently employ uh, two, you could say full-time employees. Um, they are here every day. Um, and this is right now our, our slower season. Uh, once we get into peak production, um, July through basically October, um, there's anywhere between seven and nine different people involved in our farm in some capacity. Not everybody is always in the fields. We have a pack shed manager. We have office support help. Um, so it takes a lot of hands to make an operation like this work. Um, what do we grow? That's a good question. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, we focus specifically on um, high quality specialty cut flowers um, that are sold in, into the commercial trade. So a lot of what we are producing here is sold into Chicago, Madison, and Milwaukee. And we also have our own um, wedding and event design business. Um, so, so that's another huge avenue for our fresh product. And um, Philip and my relationship really grew a lot more this past season because we started to grow hemp. Um, hemp was a, a big hot topic crop this year and we jumped in on it. Um, and I, that's, that's why we're here today. Uh, and what is the biggest change you encountered during your years of farming? Um, so one of the biggest changes, and I think it's one of the biggest opportunities really, is the, the ability uh, to pivot. Um, when I started this business quite a few years ago, um, I never thought that I would grow anything other than vegetables. Um, and the market proved me wrong. And I 
had the ability and the opportunity to pivot my business and to try new things. And I think that's very, very important. And it's a great opportunity to change your business um, and kind of view that change as an opportunity and not so much as um, a, a hindrance. So I think that answers my questions that you have for me. No, that's perfect. You know, just kind of talking about why you chose hemp and what got you into it and then moving into thinking about doing it and then actually deciding, yes, we are going to do that. You know, so this is kind of right. where I want to start talking a little bit about the pre-plant checklist, if you will, you know, the budget. Absolutely. What were the things that you looked at uh, before you got involved in considering your existing infrastructure and what you had the ability to do? You know, kind of what was your guiding um, your rules or principles to get into this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when we started to even think about growing hemp, we we were set in the fact that we were going to grow it like uh, we do our other specialty crops. Um, so everything that we grow here at Clara Joyce is um, not on open ground. Um, all of our field space is um, built on raised beds that we use a bed shaper to do. Um, and those beds are covered in a, a biodegradable film. So we already had all of the equipment to do that going into it. So we had that part of the infrastructure. We already had the greenhouse space to grow our own transplants. We had all the flats, we had a great soil source. So we had all of those things lined up. And we also had the land, which is very important if you're gonna grow things. Um, and another big thing that some people didn't factor into um, their, their pre-planting was the ability to irrigate. And Irrigation, I think, is kind of viewed as a, as a one-page thing. Irrigation, to some folks, is just to water the plants. And irrigation offers so much more than just watering. Irrigation and having an irrigation system in place or the ability to have an irrigation system allows you to directly fertilize, in our case with drip irrigation, the root zone where that nutrient is needed in the highest volume. Um, so that was a huge, huge thing. Um, that we had going for us and the ability to have an irrigation system is huge. Um, so I think as far as infrastructure and planting, um, those are the biggest things. Um, the other big thing that we found as the season progressed is you have to have a place to dry this crop if you are going to go more of the traditional hang drying method. Um, I think we had about two acres of our own that we needed to dry and it took a lot more space than I think any of us ever imagined. Um, so you definitely need to factor that into it. Um, and also the biggest thing behind all of this is you need to be able to support it financially um, because it's, it's not a cheap crop to grow. You're not buying a bag of $10 bird seed and sowing it on the ground. These, these plants cost money. And you have to be able to not only afford that, but all of the things that they need to grow throughout the season. Great. All right. So, you know, you kind of took all these things into account. Where did you look for potential? Did you do any um, research ahead of time on market prices, uh, kind of budgeting that way, trying to get a rough idea of cash flow? Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate here um, that I don't like to do projects bigger than I can handle on my own. Um, so anything that I do, I don't take out a loan for if I can help it. Um, and I think that was important this year because there were so many unknowns. Um, market price at the beginning of the season for raw biomass for CBD was $35 to $40 a pound. Um, for dry weight. And if you use that number to calculate your season, you could have made $3 million on a pretty reasonable acreage. Um, but as the season progressed and as more and more product was put onto the market, that price dropped tremendously. Um, and that's just like any other commercially available crop is that price is going to fluctuate. Um, but especially with a specialty crop like this, um, and because it is such a, a trendy crop, it is an extremely volatile market. Um, and I th think that was a, a big kicker for a lot of growers um, is they were using that 35 to $40 a pound number and basing their entire season off of it. Um, so that was tricky. And I honestly don't have a good answer for you, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you didn't have any like places that you went online to kind of maybe figure out what um, a higher low price was talking to maybe local processors or experienced growers, any information like that? 
We were working with um, a few growers up in Wisconsin, kind of on and off throughout the season, um, who either had grown this previously or knew people who had. Right. Um, so we had a little bit of an idea that there was a market for it, um, but we didn't necessarily have a buyer in mind. Um, there were a few processors that we were talking with. Um, most of them happened to flake out throughout the season. Um, so that was an interesting thing. Sorry, I was leading the witness there. I wanted to make sure uh, we, we talk about how important it is to uh, speak with people ahead of time, you know, and, and have that information available. Right. Uh, just to some of our guests, can you please make sure you're muted and your videos are off and you're catching some feedback? Great, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, moving into field selection, we all know how critical field selection can be uh, to a successful crop. What were some of the biggest factors in mind in choosing where you were going to put this crop? So one of the things that we uh, wanted to make sure of is that we needed to have good drainage. Um, this this crop or this plant um, is known to have a very vigorous and woody uh, root system. And when you're working with a plant like that, you don't want it to be sitting in water for any period of time. Um, so good drainage was very, very crucial. Um, and also we wanted to find a soil that was as low clay as possible. Um, and we're very fortunate here to have a very high quality soil um, and we needed to have that good quality to make our beds for our transplanter. Um, and we were pulling the drip line out of the beds yesterday and this is one of our stumps that was left over from last year. Um, and we will talk about this later I'm thinking if we talk about like nutrition and nutrient. Um, but good soil is a huge, huge factor when it comes to um, a plant like that. So drainage is crucial, low, low clay if possible. Okay, great. Um, I mean, and considering this too, you know, you're doing raised beds, which changes things a little bit from your traditional planting into that type of soil, right? So that's a factor Absolutely. considering uh, for our audience as well. It's just a different um, production system. All right, so moving into fertility, soil testing, nutrient, and uh, uh, um, soil amendments, fertility, what were some of the things you looked at um, to make sure that this was going to be a good fit for you? You know, where did you, uh, where did you sample if you did this past year and what were you looking for? So we were, we, we made a, a rookie mistake. We did not soil test this spring um, when we were prepping our space for the hemp, um, but I wanted to make sure, um, and I know that this is consistent for our entire field, um, because we do soil tests for the flowers because that's important. Um, we don't necessarily have any heavy metal um, issue here on the farm. Um, so that is important because these plants will suck up anything and everything that they have access to. Um, they're just that vigorous when it comes to growing. Um, so that's very important. And um, as far as soil amendments. Um, we're constantly amending our soil throughout the growing season um, with the fertilizer that we're either injecting or foliar feeding. Um, so going into the season, I want to see a relatively high um, nitrogen level um, because that's going to encourage a bigger, fuller, bushier, greener plant. And when you're working with a plant of this nature where you're focusing on bud, you want to have as many branches and bracts as you can. And nitrogen is going to help facilitate that process. Um, so nitrogen is a, a very big one when I'm looking for things that stand out to me when I'm selecting a space or starting to make beds. So you did uh, uh, injection through drip line and you also did foiler. What was your thoughts on maybe when you chose one or the other? Did, when did you stop, say, doing one versus the other? So we uh, foliar fed at least once a week, typically twice a week, um, and we also injected once a week too. Um, so from that standpoint, it was a relatively uh, intensive feeding regimen, um, and we stopped injecting as heavily. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it's once the bud was set and like half developed. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind too is that we were always changing our um, ratios and uh, fertilizer blends at, throughout the season. Um, because in the beginning of the season, you wanna have a very high nitrogen um, across the board. You wanna have, it has to be balanced, yes, but you wanna have 
higher numbers because those that plant is growing very vigorously. And as that plant matures and switches its processes over, you need to counterbalance that with your different fertilizer ratio. Um, so we were always giving those plants some sort of nutrition throughout the entire growing season. It was just changing as the as the months were progressing. If you had to pick maybe a, another crop that you've grown before or something that you're familiar with that would follow a similar pattern, what would you maybe consider? Tomatoes. 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 If you can grow a high quality tomato year after year that is consistent, you can grow this crop. Um, when we were still growing vegetables on a large scale, tomatoes were almost a mirror image. We were feeding them every week via drip and via, via foliar. Um, the nutrition was changing throughout the growing cycle. So if you can understand the sciences and the reasonings behind a tomato plant, you can totally figure out a hemp plant, 100%. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right, so moving into seed selection, you know, we got the field prep, we, we have a fertility program perhaps in place and kind of how we're gonna do that. Seed quality is one of the bigger issues facing producers currently in this industry. I think it's well documented. How do you go about getting quality seed? How about quality supply? What was your experience like that? And do you have any suggestions for our growers on the So one of the things that I would tell you um, when it comes to finding a seed source is find someone who's done this for more than a year and a half. Um, go with a reputable supplier. Build a relationship with a broker relationships are what this industry is built on and if you can have a good relationship with someone who has experience who has reliably good quality go with them trust them they're there for a reason use them as a tool um, and that was one of our mistakes that we made this year um, so moving forward we have to find a, a, a good quality producer for seed um, a good quality broker um, and ultimately you need to find someone who you trust um, and that's, that's crucial. And it, it doesn't matter if you're talking hemp or if you're talking flowers or if you're talking vegetables. Um, relationships are what situations like that are built on. Um, so definitely follow your gut when it comes to finding a seed source. Um, and trust the numbers too. If someone can show you that they consistently have gotten a good quality crop off of a certain genetic, it's probably a good idea to trust them. Um, because they've gotten those numbers from somewhere um, and typically they are science and experience based. Great. Um, so with reference to these seeds that you saw out there and we don't have to go too far into detail, but just in the field, when in performance from morphology and how they looked visually, what were some of the things you might have noticed? Um, or the, in other words, was the field uniform? Did you see a lot of variation in your field across and within varieties? So the variety that we were sold this year um, was cherry wine, um, is what it was labeled as, and we bought feminized seed. Um, so going into this, we already knew that we were supposed to have primarily females. Um, and from our experience, it was very consistent. Um, you know, we paid a lot of money for those seeds. So we were expecting to have a good quality uniform plant. And we got that. Um, now there are some other growers, um, that we were kind of working with in the area, um, and their field was not consistent at all. Um, and they too bought feminized seed. So again, this year, there were a lot of people who were not using reputable seed sources. And I think that's where a lot of the issues were coming from. Um, so uh, that again, goes right back to what we previously talked about is find those those tools of people and use them. Um, and I think this is going to kind of go in, into our next point here, Philip, of uh, feminized or non-feminized. Um, from my experience in working with other growers throughout this past season, I think it's a great idea if you're growing for CBD to pay that extra money for feminized seed. Um, that is an investment not that you're only making in the spring, but that's an investment that you're making in your payback at the end of the season. Um, so if you can afford to pay that extra money, you're gonna have less labor costs of roguing out males. Um, you're gonna be putting more high quality time and fertilizer into those females that are gonna give you a benefit at the end of the season. Um, and it's just gonna save you a lot of headache. 
Um, we, we've had some growers in the area who did not do feminized seed and it was, it was a show just <laughs> listening to them going and roguing out males in the morning at noon and at night, trying to make sure that they would not pollinate the females. Um, so I definitely think that that's got a lot of value. Um, and from my perspective, I would focus on a full season crop. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with it, but I have been involved in conversations with people who did and kind of the general consensus is to just go that full season if you're growing for CBD. Versus some of the other auto flower varieties that might be available. Right. Um, yeah. So this is a great point though. You talk about feminized versus uh, conventional or non-feminized seed. And I think it's important for us to consider that up front. You know, you're going to be spending more on seed for higher quality seed, but less on the back end for labor and literally back pain and worry about having all those males in the field and having to get rid of them. So absolutely uh, spend the money up front. Uh, has been a general consensus from growers to spend money on good seed and, and save for a uh, headache later on. But all right, so you have your seeds selected and uh, they're in the greenhouse, they're transplanting. When did you know that they were ready to be transplanted and when did you actually get them transplanted into the field? Mm -hmm. So we had a four week turnaround on uh, transplanting this year. Um, and we kind of knew going into this that we were going to be in between the 21 to 28 day window. Um, so between three and four weeks. The biggest uh, point for us, and this is, consistent for me with any crop that I'm growing in a greenhouse and I'm growing a plug for, whenever the cotyledons or the first two untrue leaves form on a seedling, when those turn yellow and start to drop off, it's time to get that plant out of that plug flat. Um, and that's a great tool for us to know um, going into this season, especially because we are growing so many transplants, um, is that that also provides us a way to space out our crop timing. Um, so that I know if I want to plant something in the field on July 1st, I need to plant that in the greenhouse four weeks before. Then that gives me a seven day cushion um, to go either way. So that's, that's a very big, big thing to keep in mind. Um, and also during its time in the greenhouse, keep an eye on the root development. Um, don't be afraid to pull a plug out of a little pot or out of the plug flat and look at the roots. The roots are going to tell you a lot. If those roots are a nice, clean white, um, they look healthy, that plug's doing just fine. If those roots are like a brown or a yellow, it probably needs some help. Um, either you're watering it too much or it needs some extra nutrient. Um, so the plant will tell you what it needs if you can just listen. Great. So you told us about when the, the plant is ready. When's the field ready? What were the, some of the conditions you were looking for to really give it a good chance to get started? So this year we started a little later than we were hoping to. Um, we didn't get in the field until July 1st um, because we got our seeds the 1st of June. Um, so we were a little delayed um, in that regards. But the biggest thing that we were looking for is we needed to have a relatively dry field so that we could make our raised beds because that's how we grow. Um, and we also needed a, a higher uh, soil temperature. Um, we didn't probe our soil when we planted because we knew it was already plenty warm, um, but that's important. Um, some of the growers that we've worked with and talked to throughout the season in Wisconsin um, were struggling that because they were planting out into their field too early and it was cool. Um, and these plants are very much like tomatoes. Once again, they like to have a warm environment. Um, so having a warm soil zone and a warm foliar space is very important. This is a crop too that because we're using full season varieties, they're going to start to flower based on day length. And that kind of, in an, uh, especially with the hemp crop, gives you an opportunity to maybe wait and be a little bit more patient about when you get into the field uh, because they will still flower right around the same time. It's just five so you might be losing some yield, but it's more important to really wait until those soils are fit before transplanting. Great. Absolutely. Um, and when would you say that you got them in? Was that, I'm sorry, did you say that June? Mid June? I want to say we seeded in June and we planted in the field in July. Right. And for about a mid-August flowering, would you say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. All right. Any experience in using clones versus transplants or in your conversations with folks in the industry? Um, so some of the things that we saw on farm tours this year is that clones might give 
give you a more reliable crop, but they aren't necessarily going to be more or a higher yield. Um, we grew only um, seed starts in our field this year, so I don't have personal experience growing clones, um, but we toured several farms in Wisconsin who did do both. And the seed plants were cons like regularly twice as large as the clone plants were. Um, and those producers were even having problems with their clones reverting um, or going hermaphroditing um, and producing both male and female reproductive organs. Um, so it's not always a foolproof way. Um, one thing that we are seeing and I'm seeing from a business perspective is that clones are traditionally two to three times more expensive than a seed start. Um, so I think that there are some pros to doing clones. Um, you're gonna get a, an exact genetic replica of that mother and that is relatively reliable, um, but it's not necessarily foolproof. Right. Okay, um, so we got the plants into the field, all right, and we're in the middle of the season. Weed management has been touted as one of the most important aspects of uh, control um, or hemp production. What was your experience like in 2019, and what equipment and strategies did you use for weed control? So weed control, regardless of the crop that you're growing, is crucial. Um, and we had an upper hand going into this because we do a raised bed system with a covered bed method. Um, and any time that you can cover your soil and put a barrier between unwanted weed seeds and the sun, that is very, very important because it's going to save you hours of weeding on the back end. Um, so really the only time that we had invested as far as weeding um, was cultivating our aisleways. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, that was relatively low. And we could even reduce that even more this year and we're planning on it by putting a pre-emergent into our aisles as we're making our beds. Um, and basically eliminating the bulk of our weeding and cultivation time. Um, granted, you still, you're still gonna have some hand weeding, pulling out the little weeds that come up in the hole that you're punching for your plug, um, but that is very, very minor. Um, we heard growers who were buying fleets of lawnmowers and mowing their aisles, trying to keep up on weeding if they didn't do a raised bed system, um, and it just didn't work for a lot of them. Um, so weeding and weed control and weed pressure is huge when it comes to growing this crop. Can you tell us a little bit about the plastic that you use? There's was several different types that were used in large amounts this year across the state. We had clear plastic, white plastic, black plastic. We had ones that were very thin, ones that were wide. Tell us a little bit about the type of plastic you used and maybe your experience versus what you saw from other growers. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that we do is uh, we have the mentality that we want to cover as much as we can to save our backs um, during season. Um, so the plastic we use is four feet wide and it makes a three foot wide bed and it's uh, four inches high. So that leaves us two extra inches of plastic to cover to make a nice tight raised bed. So that's a lot of space that's covered. Um, like Philip mentioned, uh, there were some um, growers who used a narrow plastic. It's like a 10 inch wide. It does not make a raised bed. Um, and that plastic either came in clear or in black. The clear plastic, in our opinion, is acting like a little mini greenhouse. It's great for heating up that soil if you've got cool temperatures, but it's also going to be growing those weed transplants and those weed starts and seeds just as fast, if not faster, than your hemp transplants. So really, you're not helping yourself in any way. Um, the black plastic, the narrower stuff, um, one of the things that we heard as far as complaints with that, um, and same thing with the clear plastic that was narrow too, is that was being used in direct seeding situations. Um, and slits were being made into that plastic and the seeds were being dropped into those slits. Well, not every slit has a seed, so the slits that don't have seeds of hemp are going to grow and encourage weed seeds to start. And that's not what you're going for. You're not trying to grow a field of foxtail. You're trying to grow hemp. Um, and in an area like we have with extremely high weed pressure, we need to do everything that we can to not encourage weeds to grow. Um, so that's important and it's crucial for us because we don't want extra holes in our plastic. Talking about specific plastics and different types, there are two main types of plastic. 
Um, there are biodegradable and there are oil-based. We use biodegradable films. Um, the uh, manufacturer that we use is Bio360, and it's made out of corn, potato, and wheat starch. Um, so we do not pick up our plastic at the end of the season. Um, we till it right in. It's biodegradable. Um, that's the way that it's manufactured. That's what it's made for. It's made to be tilled in. Producers that went with a oil-based plastic have a heck of a time pulling that stuff up every season um, because it cannot be tilled. It doesn't biodegrade. Um, so you have to go in and manually lift that film um, either in the fall after you've harvested or in the spring right now. Um, so biodegradable film is definitely the way to go if you're growing any volume of this crop. Great. You know, we talked a little bit about it um, earlier with in-season in management, fertility, things like that. So we won't go over that again, but um, I did want to get a, a, some information from you. What was your, your row spacing approximately um, and your planting population and, uh, and also yeah. your target population? When, what was the last part, Philip? I'm sorry, your, your target population, what were you shooting for uh, at the beginning of the season? And, and was that, you know, roughly what you had? Um, yeah, so our row spacing was, um, I'm pretty sure, five feet. Um, so from planting line to planting line was five. And in row, we were four feet between transplants. Um, and because we were doing large transplants, our, our transplants came in a 50 cell plug. That's what we grew in. And for those of you who don't know plug space or plug sizes, the plug sheets um, either come in 50, 72, 128, or 288. And 50s are relatively the, the largest um, that you'll find commercially available um, for volume plantings. Um, and that's what we use because we want to have as big of a transplant going into this as we can. Um, so we're already planting a 50 cell flat into the field. It's a very nice established plant. Um, if we can get enough water to it at first, there's no reason it's not going to grow. Um, and that was pretty consistent across the across the board uh, for us this year. So our target was between 23 and 2,500 uh, plants per acre, um, and we we got that this year. I think we had maybe a 10% loss, probably less than 10% um, as far as transplants that just didn't get in. And the reason behind that is is because we were waiting for one little part for our irrigation system to hook it up. Um, and within that week that it was back ordered because everybody needed that part, that's where we saw the most loss. Um, but this year I'm not planning on any loss. If anything, I would say three to 4% loss. Um, but because we are going into a pre-made warm bed, fertilizer already there ready to go, drip system already there ready to go, there really isn't any reason that you should be losing money on those transplants. So we talked about weed management, weed strategies there. How often would you say that you actually went through and cultivated throughout the season and, and would you be able to share the equipment that you used to do so? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we cultivated our rows once, um, only did it one time. Um, and we used a um, just a push behind uh, rototiller cultivator from Farm and Fleet, nothing fancy. Uh, it's something that we've had for years and years, and it fits right between the aisles of the biodegradable film beds. Um, so weed management from that aspect, it was not something that we were doing every week. Um, the only thing that we were doing every week was fertilizing, and uh, when we were foliar feeding, we were walking every single row. So we were getting a good visual of how the plants were doing. We were seeing if there was anything that needed to be taken care of. Um, and that was our time with the plants. Great, thank you very much. All right, so uh, we talked a little bit about fertility, we talked about weed management, disease and insect management. We know yes. that there are currently no insecticides, herbicides, pesticides labeled for the industrial hemp crop. Uh, so this year you kind of just had to sit back really and see what was happening. Please tell us a little bit about what you saw out there this year from a disease and insect perspective. So one of the things that we noticed, and it, we didn't have much pressure until the very end of the season. As the buds were maturing, um, that's when we saw the most issue. Um, we did have a small, very small borer situation going on um, in the mature mothers. Um, and we did see some white mold come in um, once we hit fall. 
once our nighttime temperatures cooled down, the dew was settling at night, and it was taking a little bit longer for that daytime temperature to get to us because part of our field is shaded. Um, we saw some white mold setting in. But my, my thought process behind, um, especially disease, not so much insect, but more so disease, if you can have a healthy plant, you're going to have a better chance fighting off disease. It's just like a person. If you are healthy, if you are strong, if you have a good immune system, you're going to have a better chance of fighting off things that are not good. Um, and it's the same thing across the board with plants. If we can make sure that all of our nutrient is there, our micronutrients are there, that plant is healthy, it's got enough water, it's going to do okay. Great. All right, so you said about mid, uh, mid August was when we, we saw that the plant was starting to flower, and then throughout the last part of August through September, that flowering, those buds are getting bigger. Uh, so we're starting to think about harvest here and when we're going to yep. get the harvest. Um, but before you can do that, you have to make sure that you get your plants tested uh, and approve that they are a compliant crop by the state of Illinois. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience with testing? and also sure. uh, experience with the Department of Agriculture and the uh, reporting that you had to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we tested our crop voluntarily, I think two times throughout the season, um, which I think was a little excessive knowing what we know now. Um, we sent our crops to, I think a lab in Wisconsin. Um, I didn't do that personally, so I can't tell you yes or no either way. Um, but we did that twice, um, and both times the tests come back clean. Um, when IDOA came to do our um, random pull test, um, it was super easy. We just set up a time with the field rep. He came out, cut a few uh, portions off of a plant, um, and within a week we knew if we were good to go or not. Going forward with this year, um, there are a few tricks that we know. If the bud is not white, you are not going to have an extremely high THC level um, because white on a mature flower is symbolistic of a high THC. Um, so knowing that general rule of thumb will kind of buy us a little bit of time and worry this year. Um, but the testing situ situation, it should not be something that people are afraid of or don't want to do um, because there's, there's nothing bad about it. As long as you were sold a good quality seed, and this goes right back to that relationship that you built with your seed broker, there is nothing that you should be afraid of um, because it doesn't really matter if you give it extra, extra nitrogen or extra phosphorus when it's growing the genetics are what are going to determine that on a large, large basis. Um, so that's very, very important. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's very important for people to understand too, that even if the, the, the crop does test above those thresholds, it's not a criminal penalty. This is a, this will not be, um, you will not get into trouble in that regard. You know, the crop will have to be destroyed. And yes, it's a loss of income, uh, but it's, it's, it's for your benefit and for the benefit of the consumer to make sure you follow um, those compliance rules and regulations. Okay, so a pretty seamless process with getting randomly selected. There, you know, we only did about 10% in the state this year, um, but that is good to know. All right, so you got the, uh, the test, you have a compliant crop, and you are thinking about, well, it's time to get this out of the field. Um, what was the, your thought process going into getting prepared for harvest? When were you preparing for harvest? And ultimately, when did you get that crop out of the field? So the biggest thing that we... Um struggled with and we did a couple different methods with um, and I mentioned it earlier being an issue is the amount of drying space that we needed um, and drying space is no joke um, if you think you're going to grow an acre of hemp and you're going to dry it in your garage you're probably wrong unless you have a 4,000 square foot garage um, <laughs> because it takes a lot of space um, one method that we did for drying is we hung a snow fence over the rafters and we um, would stick a branch into the snow fence another method that we did is we stretched cables across a barn side to side we did three layers of cable um, and then we used scaffolding and we would hook the plants over the cable um, that method was 
so much easier than the snow fence. So going forward, we're not doing snow fence, we're just doing the cables if we have to dry our crop again in that method this year. Um, another thing that you, you have to have is you have to have a way to transport your plants from the fields to your drying space. Um, because I don't want to have to pull three plants at a time and each plant weighs 30 pounds back and forth to a greenhouse or to a barn. You have to have trailers or wagons or some way to transport those plants. As far as a timeline, um, I don't necessarily remember what triggered us to start harvesting. Um, I think, I know we did notice some drying of the leaves um, in the bud. Um, we did an, a, a final test when we were in the field and none of our oil levels had either matured or gone higher or decreased. Um, and I think that last test was one of the reasons that we started to pull the plug. Um, and also labor is a huge thing. Harvesting is very labor intensive. Um, we did a little co-op situation with harvesting and we worked with another producer and between the two of us we had 11 people working harvesting um, whether it was cutting the plant pulling it from the row to the wagon transporting the wagon to the barn um, hanging those plants shuffling wagons around it takes a lot of people if you're doing a volume and if you're doing it in this drying situation um, so that's another huge factor to keep in mind uh, were you, what were you using to cut these plants down? Was this a chainsaw type situation? So we were using a um, saw blade that goes onto the bottom of a weed eater. Um, we, it's used for brush clearing. Um, <laughs> and I'll see if I can show you. I don't know if you can see it on this one. But it is essentially a saw blade um, that you just hack into the plant and it cuts it right off. Um, it's pretty easy. It's pretty clean. You can see there's not a lot of... Um, raggedy edges and it's relatively fast too. Um, so as we were harvesting, we had two of those um, weed eater saw blade things going um, and we had two people pulling them from the row to the wagon and one guy stacking in the wagon. Okay. Get them out of the field, we take them to the shed and we hang them and you know yes. these plants are going to be at about 70% moisture. It's October, it's cold, it's damp. What were some of the strategies maybe you used to get that those down uh, to a durable, dry, dry moisture? What was that experience like for you? And, and did you have any external dehumidifiers or fans that you used to help? Lots of fans. Um, air movement overnight is crucial. Um, and also, we would close all of the buildings up at night, and we would open them in the morning. Um, because nighttime is when that dew is going to settle. It's going to go, that dew is going to go low. Um, and you, even though you're holding your plants in a building, you don't want to get any additional moisture coming in either the ends, the sidewalls, none of that. Um, so the doors would be closed, the building would be closed up at night. Um, and then once either the sun came out or it was warm enough during the daytime, all of those spaces would be opened back up. The fans would still be on. Um, be because even in October during the day, we can still lose some humidity from inside that building. Um, and it did take quite a while for those plants to completely dry down. Um, I would say the dry time was four weeks before it was super dry. Um, and we didn't start processing and stripping until like December. And we harvested that crop in October. Um, so those plants sat for quite a while and they were very, very dry. And what did you use for storage? before you're going to the extraction. So once we were in the process of stripping, we were using 55 gallon um, clear plastic bags, BPA free bags. Um, and we were able to get between 30 and 35 pounds of uh, biomass into those bags. Um, and I, we do know that there were some other producers in the area that were using um, a bucker to get the bud off. They weren't um, stripping it by hand. They were running it through a machine. And the machine was getting that bud and those leaves chopped smaller so they could fit more weight into those bags. Um, not that that is a huge make or break situation, um, but it's just something to keep in mind is that if you have to store 120, 30, 35 pound bag, that takes up space. Um, so again, a kind of an overriding theme is you have to have enough space if you're going to do it this way.
That's a great point because it, we've seen tremendous variability in the weight of these bag super sacks based off of density, right? How, uh, how fine is the product that you converted it into? Um, you know, so that's something you really need to take into account. You can't take a look at what others have done and say, all right, that's how much I'm going to be able to store. You really have to make sure you're aware of how they did it ahead of time and how it's going to fit with how you plan to store this material. You know, I, I, I was telling growers earlier on in the season, if you grow three acres, where are you going to put store three acres of Christmas trees? You know, because that's the amount of material you're going to have at the end of the season. So a great point. All right, so what was the storage moisture that you did? So you used uh, the BPA bags. Was uh, condensation a concern using those? How did you maybe mitigate that? So we made sure that there were no stored bags in direct sunlight because any hot spot is going to pull that and make that moisture active again. Um, and we were storing at anywhere between an 8 to an 11% moisture. So that's very, very dry. Um, I think the target number that we heard one time was 12%. Um, so I wanted to be below that if I can help it because when it comes to extraction, they can add moisture in if they need to. And when we're storing things in a sealed, relatively sealed plastic bag, I don't want to have any form of or any possibility of mold or rot or any of that considering the thousands of dollars that we've invested up to this point. So I was very comfortable storing at a lower humidity or lo lower moisture. Um, and I think that that's important. Great. So we're gonna, we're almost wrapping up here, um, but before we start to open this up to questions uh, to the audience here, I wanted to ask you if you had any advice that you could give to growers who are trying to get into this for the first time, any greenhorns out there, what advice would you give them if they said, hey Drew, I wanna grow hemp, what do you got? What would you tell this them? Is I would tell them that this is not corn. Um, don't think that you're going to grow 60 acres from your tractor seed, um, especially in our area, because that is not an easy thing to do. Um, this is not a crop that you plant with a drill. This is not necessarily something that is, like I said, done from a tractor seed. This is a very labor intensive crop. Um, there are ways to make it less labor intensive, yes, and we do those, but I can tell you that this is still a labor intensive crop. Um, and if you don't have the resources to do this, focus on building those systems for your situation and your operation before you jump in and invest 100000 into this. Um, that's my tidbit. Don't get in too heavy. Don't get in too big. Um, do it step by step. Um, you need to crawl before you can walk and you have to walk before you can run. Um, and I think that simple mentality is very, very important to this situation. Great. So do you provide any custom services? Will you be providing transplants or plugs this year? And if so, how can we get a hold of you? So we are doing a little bit of custom growing this year. Uh, we're, we've already contracted out um, 50, 55,000 uh, starts. Um, so we are kind of maxed for this season, um, but we are opening up the opportunity um, to grow more custom plugs for next year, uh, for the 2021 season. Um, we charge $1.65 for a plug, and that is contingent on you providing the seed. The producer has to buy the seed. Um, so again, the producer has to be the one who builds that relationship, that builds that that bond with your broker um, and you are responsible for paying for that seed. Um, so that is our one stipulation for growing plugs um, and we don't do clones, we only do uh, seeding. Um, so and if you want to get a hold of us, you can send me an email. I know, um, I think Philip put my email out there. It's clarajoyceflowers at gmail.com. Um, I will share so, all the information with a follow-up email and put it on our website so they can get a hold of you. Um, yep. I would also take a moment before we open this up for any questions to encourage you folks to take our program evaluation that's going to be sent out uh, at, with all this information to tell us how we can serve you better and what you thought of the program. Please fill it out. It really helps us out, guide these programs and how we can do these better for you. Um, with that, I would like to open some questions up. we got some time here. Uh, any questions for Drew from the audience, please just enter them in the chat box and we will go. Uh, from Laverne, what did you do with the stock after stripping? So once we stripped all of our plants, um, 
we compacted that mountain of stalks down with a uh, skid loader and then we pushed them through a chopper and chopped them into a wagon and i'm going to use that as mulch um, i know that there were uh, some producers who were trying to sell that uh, stem and that stalk um, but we had so much biomass as it was i wasn't necessarily so focused on making that be productive. I had other ways to use that um, on my flower farm and that's what we're gonna do with it. How many pounds of biomass did you end up with? And we can maybe make that on a per acre, ba excuse me, per acre basis if you had an idea. Um, and then there's a follow-up question, did you take it to a processor? Were you able to sell either for the crude or biomass? So we ended up with about 4,000 pounds of biomass um, this year. Um, and that is in 35 pound bags. Um, so that's a lot of bags. And we, I'm pretty sure ended up selling it to a, either a broker or a processor in Chicago. Um, and I can't necessarily give you too much information on that, that buying process because I was not involved with it. Um, my involvement with this year was just growing it. Um, I have experience growing plants and that was how I was able to help with this. Um, so I, I don't have a lot of information about contracts or um, selling your product. Really just going to have to be making sure you make those connections if you can ahead of time and speaking with the processor. Um, a big part of that too will be knowing how they want their product before you even grow it so you know if you can fill uh, that order. Okay. Um, I Absolutely. understand this is a tough question, but what is best guess for biomass price this season? Um, if you, that's a tough question. Yikes. Um, if you don't know, Drew, we can, uh, we can skip that one, but I, <laughs> that is a good question. Uh, I wish I knew the answer. Yeah. Um, the farming doesn't concern us as much as a lack of willingness of buyers to sign a contract. Any recent observations or changes? So here's what I do, and I've never been a fan of a signed contract. Um, and because that this, this industry is so volatile, um, I did not want to sign a contract for this year. Um, and because we are dealing with, and we were planning on drying our crop all the way, um, that's a stable product. That crop, once it's dried, stripped, and put into a bag, it's not going to go bad. Um, so I was not afraid of sitting on that crop up until March, April, May, if we had two of this year. Um, so I didn't want to sign a contract and jeopardize getting a lower cut for it. Um, one thing that we noticed last year is that as certain states were coming into production and they were putting their crop on the market, it got so saturated. Um, and you have to have the mentality of all of that biomass will be worked through eventually and there will, there will be a higher price point out there. It's just like corn and soybeans and wheat and everything else that's grown on a commercial scale. If you can weather the storm and hold on to that and not have to get your money back immediately, I would feel so much more comfortable doing that than signing a contract for a third of what you might get otherwise. Um, again, it's playing the markets. Um, you're probably going to have some sleepless nights when biomass numbers hit $4 a pound um, because that will probably happen. Um, but it's just part of the game. And also, I think that's a big part of this too is cash flow. You know, a lot of folks who maybe got into this industry, we're hoping to get some cash flow early on. If you can weather the storm, if you're enabled, if you're allowed to do that, or going to be able to do that, I think that's going to be a huge benefit. So again, yeah. starting small and figuring yeah. out is going to be important. Um, we talked a little bit about tomatoes being very similar from a fertility standpoint, but maybe from a growth or morphology perspective, what flower or plant would be most similar to hemp from your learned opinion? Ooh, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I grow that would be, the interesting thing with hemp and CBD that we noticed is that you're not growing for the seed. Um, we grow some flowers for the seed uh, because we do sell some seed stock. Um, but hemp is different because you're growing for the oil. Um, so it's hard for me to tell you it's like growing celosia or it's like growing peonies because it's not. Um, from a care standpoint, the best 
uh, replica or base thing to look, look off of um, is tomatoes um, because they have a lot of those same growth habits. Um, they have a, a similar but not exact replica version of um, their nutrient needs. Um, so it doesn't necessarily answer your question, um, but tomatoes, in my opinion, are the best thing to base off of. Yeah, this is its own its own animal because of how it you're is. growing it and what you're growing it for. You're harvesting it before it's mature. You're also depriving it of its ability to be pollinated. So you're yep. messing with the biology a little bit. It's a very unique plant uh, to grow CBD hemp. You know, these it is. Uh, have you had any experience with direct seeding? I know we talked about it on Tuesday in our edition with High Plains Grains. Um, so Mike, if you didn't see that one, go check us out there. But uh, did you have any experience with direct seeding this year or know anybody? Who did? No, we, everything we did was transplanting. And moving forward, I only want to do transplanting because I want to be able to hold my seed sources accountable if they sell me a low quality and low germination rate seed. When you are direct seeding, you as a producer really don't have any idea how many seeds went into that field. The person who does your direct seeding will give you an idea, um, and you can go out and count your seeds after they germinate, but you really don't know. Um, and that's why I won't do direct seeding. And it makes sense for your production system. You are a specialty grower, and you have the equipment to, to treat this as a Absolutely. specialty crop, so it makes sense to do so. How long did harvest take with the 11-person crew for your two acres? So for our two acres, maybe a day. Um, if we would have gone hard and just gotten it all done, it would have been a day. Um, we only did our fields for a couple hours in the morning, and then we would go to our other farmer's field, and we would work there the rest of the day. Um, he had five acres planted, and we did not have five acres planted. So it was more of a, a focus to get his done, and then we would do ours in the morning. Okay. Um, is biofilm trickier? to lay than plastic? So the thing with biofilm is you're never going to get a super tight bed like you can with traditional plastic. And the reason that is is that traditional plastic has a high oil content and biofilm does not. So you're always going to have a little bit of ripple um, with the biofilm. Um, I'm okay with having a little bit of ripple as long as you can get that hole for your transplant poked into that plastic as soon as you can. Because if wind gets under that unpunched plastic, it's going to lift it up like a kite. But if you can have holes for that wind to escape from, it's going to stay down no problems. Um, you are probably going to have a little lift up um, irregardless of whatever you do. So you're going to have a couple hours going back out and covering up the edges with a shovel. Um, but I would much rather spend that time doing that than spending 10 hours lifting plastic in the spring. So it's a trade-off. Seems like we have a lot of trade-offs here, Drew. We do, we do, absolutely. <laughs> uh, can you let the plants dry in the field? If so, how long? No. <laughs> All right, so that's a, I think it's great uh, to, 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 to bring that up, right? So we're thinking about the quality yeah. of the product and what we're trying to harvest. We have these buds, these flowers that are rich in oil, rich in cannabinoids, and if we let them sit in the dirt and open them up to disease, bacterial, pathogens, things like that, insects. Um, so that's something you want to be very careful about, how you get this crop out of the field. The less times you have to handle it or move it or leave it exposed, the better off you're going to be typically. Um, but so you went straight from chopping onto the uh, – trailer into the shed for drying is that yeah okay. absolutely and even when you're drying in the shed um and this is the big thing too with uh the the idea of field drying um you want to get that away from the sun as fast as you can because once you cut that plant down that plant is no longer immune and has an ability to shield itself from the sun if you look super super close at any plant typically you'll see little itty bitty tiny hairs on the leaf and on the stem of that plant um, and what those are is that's the plant's ability to reflect sunlight now as soon as you cut that plant off that ability is basically done um, and is if sun is hitting those oil those oils in the plant um, i don't know the, the exact name for those oils whatever they are um, but 
that's that's degrading your oil crop. Um, so you want to get it as away from the sun as fast as you can. Um, and like Philip said, I wouldn't want that sitting in a muddy field if it got rained on because all that oversplash is going to go right onto those buds. Um, so it's more of a quality uh, mentality and just get it out of the field as fast as you can. What is the best size plug to start plant in? So. I would not go smaller than a 72. Um, we're very comfortable at a 50. You can either do a 50 round plug or a 50 square plug. 72s come in both round and square. Um, I would not go smaller than a 72. We have seen producers go into the ground with a 128. Um, but if you are planting on a wide spacing and you don't have um, super close emitter spacing on your drip line if you're doing drip line um, you need that bigger bulkier plug when we're growing flowers we plant uh, 128s and 288s into the field but we're plant we're planting them typically six to nine inches apart and our drip line emitters are four inches apart so there's a lot more water there when we're doing hemp we're planting a 50 cell count which is about this big around um, and our emitters on our drip line line are four feet apart. Um, so that's a big gap for that water to have to travel if there's not an emitter right next to that plant. So you kind of have to keep that in mind too. Uh, Stacy McCaskill from uh, the Sulcana uh, Grower Cooperative has a question here. How many of your 55,000 starts are you keeping yourself to grow this year? So I think we're doing 5,000 or not 5,000, five acres this year. Um, so if we do five acres at our 2,500 density, that's about 12,000 um, for our own. Okay. Um, just, I guess, an FYI for you growers out there. Stacy, if you want to put your, your grower contact information in the chat box, Stacy works with Silcana Grower Cooperative out of Hanover. They might be somebody you want us to talk to if you're looking for starts this year, uh, just to give you an option. Um, so go ahead and do that for us, Stacy. Um, let's see, from NSN, um, and Drew, this is a tricky question. Question: PPM of macros in your irrigation. So PPM, um, we didn't do PPM. We did uh, parts per hundred, um, and our irrigation system is set up for one to a hundred. Um, so we're doing a relatively high feed. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind is that your injector uh, can be throttled for different. Uh, things and it's easy to convert hundreds to thousands yes I get that um, but for our system we did everything in hundreds um, so it's a larger volume um, and larger density we missed a question from Ed um, have you sold your crop I'd like to talk a little bit about your growing system um, so Ed we have sold a, a portion of our crop we're still sitting on half of it um, our buyer has to work through the buildup that they've managed to build up. Um, and our growing system, I think we've talked about this quite a bit uh, throughout our time together today, um, but we were planting out uh, 50 cell transplants into um, a biofilm bed. We are drip irrigating um, and we're um, injecting fertilizer through that drip system and we're also doing foliar feeding. So I think that should get you a good start. Uh, from Jen, what fertilizers did you use? What would be the timeline of changing the NPK throughout the season? I know we talked a little bit about that earlier, but just a, a quick run through. Yeah. Um, so Jen, we worked really, really close with Miller Fertilizer. Um, I think that they're out of Pennsylvania. Um, and I know we started in with um, a nursery starter during our time in the greenhouse. And then we went to uh, a triple 20 for the first few weeks. Um, and then from there, once that plant is established, everything changes. Um, and we were calling our broker from Miller every week, at least. Um, and we were trying different things. Um, I don't remember, honestly, because that was a long time ago, um, the exact ratios and numbers that we used. I have it all written down in the barn, but I don't have it with me. Um, so again, that's that's a relationship. And the company that we worked with, again, is Miller Fertilizer. Um, so feel free to reach out. I know they have an entire team that is just hemp focused. Um, so they will be able to get you in touch with someone who is in your region, in your area, um, and they can help you fertilize. 
Um, would you recommend a cover crop of oats? Uh, can you leave oats in when you plant hemp? Um, I'm not sure if this is going to be something you can answer or, or discuss, but um. yeah. Um, so the interesting thing that I'm seeing with a cover crop um, is that they would have to be a super, super early uh, cover crop because this is such a long uh, maturity plant. Um, one thing that we did see was um, there was a grain that would, was planted, um, whether it's oats or rye or whatever, and then it would be crimped um, or the field would be rolled before the transplants were planted. Um, and I do think that there is a lot of value to having that um, layer of um, organic matter on the field and then they plant it directly into that. Now, with that system, you can't do a raised bed, you can't do a biofilm bed. Um, our subsoil drip irrigation couldn't be done um, because that field is just an entire field of crimped grain, cereal grain, and they're planting their plug directly into that. Um, from our perspective and the way that we do it, it would be very difficult to clean that field, get that drip irrigation out, till the soil, get your cover crop in um, all before winter comes. And the other thing that you need to keep in mind when you're doing drip irrigation is we don't rip any irrigation out of our beds until the following spring. And we need that frost from the winter to go into that bed basically shatter all the cells in that plant um, and heave up that soil. Because if you can shatter the cells in the root system, that drip line is gonna come up much easier. Um, and when we're working with roots that are as big of a fat as a fat Sharpie marker, um, we need all the help we can get to break drip line up through that. Um, so do I think that it could be done doing a cover crop? Yes, it'd be a lot of work though, in our situation. All right, one last question here before we wrap things up. Uh, what transplanter did, oh, we got two more. What transplanter did you use and what was your experience using it? So we used a water wheel transplanter um, that I think we got used off of some group on Facebook. Um, and uh, the spacing that we used was a 42 or a 44 inch inline. Um, so it was just shy of four feet. And if you've not, had experience with a water wheel. Um, they're a great tool as long as your tractor can go slow enough. Um, that's the biggest thing that we see consistently across the board with people who have water wheels is that you even need to have a hydrostatic tractor or something with a creeper gear that can go slow enough um, so that hole can be punched. It can be filled with water from the water tank and you can also have enough time to get that plug planted into that hole sufficiently. Fantastic. Um, and see, one last question I think we have from uh, Laverne is what